Well, that did open the event Moby screen on me. Okay. And then Kara, if you watch the chat, you'll be able to see how many people have entered the room too. So that, well, you won't be able, if you can see it, you, I think you said you had another one open. So that's kind of nice. Okay, should we get started? Yes, I'm gonna mute. Okay. Hi, good morning, everybody. Welcome to our uh, presentation. We're so excited to have you join us for this breakout session. Uh, my name is Kara Hinderlite. I'm the Communications and Data Visualization Associate um, for the Rock River Coalition. I'm gonna be the moderator for this session. Um, today we have Pat Patricia Cicero, who is the director of the Jefferson County Land and Water Conservation Department, and she's going to be joined by Leanna Spencer, who's the Lake Ripley uh, manager for the Lake Ripley Management District. Um, their presentation will discuss Lake Shoreland and Shallows surveys, um, survey overview, and potential data uses. Um, and just as a quick reminder, please... Um, Place your question under the Q&A tab and not in the chat um, so we can get those answered at the end of the presentation. Um, so I'll go ahead and turn it over to Leanna and Patricia. Good morning, everybody. Thanks so much for joining us. Uh, I'm Patricia Cicero. I'm the director of the Land and Water Conservation Department in Jefferson County. And good morning, everybody. My name is Leanna Spencer. I am the Lake Manager for the Lake Ripley Management District. Before we get started, uh, we just want to thank Katie Hine, who works for the Department of Natural Resources. Throughout our presentation, you will see the DNR logo on some of our slides. Uh, these slides were provided by Katie from a previous presentation she's given. So thanks, Katie. During this presentation, we will be going over the importance of shoreland and shallow surveys, the protocols associated with these surveys, how we analyze the results, and the ways in which we use the data that we have gathered. Rock Lake, the larger lake on the map, circled in blue at the top, had a shoreland and shallow survey completed back in 2016, and there is another survey planned for 2021. Lake Ripley, the smaller lake, just completed a shoreland and shallow survey during the summer of 2020. Our next anticipated shoreland, shoreland and shallow survey for Lake Ripley is the summer of 2025. There are many elements that make up a healthy lake shore. On the land, this includes three layers of native plants, shrubs, trees, and a herbaceous layer that includes flowers and grasses. In addition, wood in the water, such as fallen trees, provides essential habitat for both lake and land dwelling animals. There are two terms uh, that we wanna go over um, for you because they appear in our uh, presentation and are also on this slide. Uh, one is riparian, which means the land that's next to the water. And littoral means the lake area adjacent to the land. How we manage our shoreland areas can impact our lakes either positively or negatively. A national lakes assessment identified the loss of shoreland habitat as the number one stressor to our lakes. With increased development, both on the land and in the water, research has shown that there is a decline in shoreland and aquatic plants, songbirds, and green frogs in the shoreland areas. Living on lake property is very different than living on a city lot. When property owners choose to maintain or restore native vegetation on their lake shore, the result is that they protect the lake that they love. The photo on the left shows that the property owner chose to leave all the vegetation and still has peer access to the lake. The photo on the right shows some changes that a property owner made to add native vegetation and at the same time, they maintain their pier and boat access to the lake. 
All data that gets collected for this survey is submitted to the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources and then uploaded onto their lakes and AIS data viewer for everyone to access. Go ahead and jot down the link if you'd like to check it out for later. From there, you can generate lake-wide statistics and compare these statistics to a specific threshold, which helps identify healthy habitat. Overall, this survey summarizes the condition of surface waters in Wisconsin. You are also able to compare changes of a specific site over the years. For example, if someone puts in a rain garden one year, you will get the chance to compare its growth next time you complete the survey. And sorry, I realized I didn't click uh, fast enough for the link. So I'll just wait a few moments um, if you want to jot down that AIS um, lake viewer link, um, as well as um, letting you know that um, I know not all the data is on that viewer. So it doesn't mean that your lake doesn't have a shoreline and shallow survey. There are a variety of ways that the data can be used. It can be incorporated in different management and comprehensive plans. It can help make management decisions and it can help us to better understand the trend in our lakes ecology. The data that I collected this past summer is currently being implemented into the 2021 update of the Lake Ripley Management Plan. It has the potential to show us where our lake is now in terms of shoreline habitat. This survey can also aid in alerting us to specific areas of the lake where we should be focusing some of our efforts. The survey really encourages the field crew to assess every aspect of the parcels, allowing us to see problem areas or problem plants. For example, recognizing that a specific parcel has purple loosestrife or any other invasive plant and addressing that situation ASAP can prevent the spread of that invasive to other surrounding parcels. Resource experts have typically done these surveys because they are very detailed and depending on the size of the lake, they can take a lot of time to implement. For the surveys that were done on Lake Ripley and Rock Lake, we followed the protocols that were developed by the Department of Natural Resources. We encourage others to use these protocols but they because they not only result in great baseline data but they enable users to make comparisons between multiple lakes. Um, and it looks like we don't have the link to that there, um, but we could provide that at another time. The Shoreline and Shallows survey captures data associated with parcels. In order to have this information on the boat with us, we used a device that contained a map of the parcels the parcel IDs and a line indicating what is 35 feet of, uh, from the water. Lake Ripley and Rock Lake both used an iPad and, and did, did the survey as well as a program um, called ArcGIS Collector and that program is free to use. The iPad we used also had GPS, which enabled us to see our location on the map, which on the map you can see uh, that's the blue dot. This was very helpful for determining the location of the property lines when we were viewing each parcel from the boat. The blue dot is also very useful if you are unsure about which parcel you are in front of. These photos uh, show a good example of how we identify the parcel boundary as well as the 35 foot buffer. To help with determining what is contained within 35 feet of the water, we also used a range finder to measure the distances. There are two different parts to this survey. During the first part of the survey, the crew goes around the entire lake and surveys each parcel individually. Each parcel takes roughly five to 10 minutes to collect all the data that you need. You wanna make sure you take your time at each parcel to ensure that you are collecting all the data and not missing anything. We collect a lot of data that will be important when addressing issues on the lake. Within the riparian buffer zone, which is the water next to shore, we collect percent cover of different vegetation types within 35 feet of the water, which you can see in the top left. 
You record the percentage of canopy, shrub, and herbaceous layers within the parcel, and also the percentages of impervious surfaces, manicured lawns, agricultural use, and any other type of cover. We then look for any human structures within the water next to shore. We also look for runoff concerns within the entire parcel, and then along the shoreline, we document any existing modifications to the banks. During the second part of the survey, the field crew makes another loop around the lake to measure and document any wood in the water. Here is the data sheet that the Wisconsin DNR developed, where all of the data regarding each individual parcel is recorded. Every parcel gets its own data sheet, and you record the parcel number at the top to keep track of which parcel is which. This data sheet was updated in July 2020 by the Wisconsin DNR and is the most current. Additional data can be collected based on the needs of your specific lake, but it won't be uploaded into the Lake Viewer database. However, it could provide you with some really useful information that is pertinent to your lake and the projects you have going on. This is an example of the parcel information we had on our iPad that shows the parcel boundaries and the 35 foot buffer zone that we evaluated. The next step was to estimate the percent cover of the tree canopy, shrub and herbaceous layers that are contained within 35 feet of the water. Percent cover is the percent of space each layer takes up in the buffer area. We also collected the percent coverage of impervious surfaces, manicured lawn, agriculture, and other items such as duff, soil, and mulch. Once you've completed the survey and submit your data to the Wisconsin DNR, you can create maps like this one to review your data. These maps are extremely useful and easy to produce once the data has been collected. These are not the only parameters that these maps offer to show you. You make these maps on the Lakes and AIS Mapping Tools website. As you look at this map of Lake Ripley, you can see which specific parcels have a really great shrub and herbaceous layer, which are highlighted in green. And you can also see the areas around the lake that have become less herbaceous and shrub cover. These areas in orange, tan, and yellow and they are places where you can focus on implementing shoreline improvements, such as participating in a cost share agreement. Other parameters that you can include on your map are runoff concerns, aquatic plants, and bank modifications, to name a few. This map shows the percentage of manicured lawn on any given parcel on Lake Ripley. As you can see in the legend, the tan color represents lawns with one to 25% manicured, the peach color represents 26 to 50%. The burnt orange color represents 51 to 75%. And the red color represents 76 to 100% manicured lawn. Seeing so much of the burnt orange and red colors can initially be concerning. However, it's important to think of these areas as potential spots for improvements. Here is yet another parameter that you can map from the data collected during this survey. This map represents the percentages of impervious surfaces around Lake Ripley. This map can be a useful tool to show to homeowners around the lake to educate them about why it is so important to limit the amount of impervious surfaces on your property. In the previous slides, you saw the Lake Ripley map showing percent cover of vegetation and lawn. For Rock Lake, we also produced a map that showed which parcels were meeting the state standard of 65% vegetation and 35% viewing and access corridor that's within 35 feet of the lake. These parcels are highlighted in green on the map. We then calculated that 28.3% of the entire shore, lake shore met the state standard. A couple years later, the Rock Lake Improvement Association used that information to include a measurable goal in their lake management plan update. The goal was to increase the length of shoreland areas on the lake that meet the state standards for vegetation within 35 feet of the water. 
In addition, they now have several targeted actions to educate and assist landowners with planting native shoreline gardens. The Healthy Lakes and Rivers program can be used to cost share native plant gardens next to the water. The Rock Lake Shoreline and Shallows Survey is planned to be repeated every five years in order to check on progress of meeting this goal. Next in the process of the survey, we count all the human structures that are in the riparian buffer zone for each parcel. These, this includes buildings such as residences, sheds, boathouses, garages, or even commercial buildings. You would also count stairs, paths, fire pits, and boats on shore, including kayaks, canoes, and paddle boards. The other category would include things such as patios or retaining walls. You should avoid counting small objects that are easily moved, such as toys or lawn chairs. We wanted to give you guys the chance to count how many human structures on land you can count in this parcel. So please go ahead and type in the chat how many human structures you see. We'll give you about 15 seconds. <laughs> There's one, and there's two. Two is the right answer. This is a good example of how you really need to train your eye before the survey. You need to know what you are looking for. Hydrologic modifications refer to a number of items that impact the flow of water and potential pollutants to the lake. The more items in this category that are noted on a parcel could indicate more potential impacts to the lake. Therefore, these items are not only noted when they are within 35 feet of the lake, uh, but they are also documented when they are contained on the rest of the parcel. The items that we document in this category include areas that slope directly to the lake, bare soil, channelized flow, and any slumping banks. So we'll go through another example. Uh, so how many hydrologic modifications can you see in this photo? So there's one set of stairs, another set of stairs, and also a sloped lawn. We are only looking at the parcel um, that those circles are surrounding. Um, all of these things slope directly to the lake. So that's why they're considered hydrologic modifications. Another important set of data has to do with any modifications that have happened to the bank, including artificial beaches, seawalls, rock riprap, and other erosion control structures. We also gather information on the amount of bank erosion. Later, the landowners with property that contained erosion can be contacted to offer assistance with dealing with that erosion. And this uh, photo just shows a good example of on the left uh, property, that's a seawall, and on the right is an example of uh, rock riprap. So the next part of the survey consists of counting the human structures in the littoral zone or the actual water next to the shore. It doesn't matter if the boat lift has a canopy or not for this part of the survey. You record them just the same. Any boathouse that gets recorded must be over the water. And the other category would include things such as kayaks or canoes that are tied up within the water. Here is yet another map that you can generate with the lakes and AIS viewer. It breaks down the different categories of human structures and shows the most prevalent structures as the larger circles. Everything is color coded, which makes it really easy to read. So let's try this example. How many structures do you see in the littoral zone? We'll give you just a few seconds. So we have the boat, 
we have the pier, we have the boathouse, and we have the jet ski lift. So four all together. This table shows the rock lake data collected on structures in the water. Uh, some of this information was of interest to the local municipality when they were reviewing their ordinances related to structures on the lake. So you can see there's a variety of uses for this data. There's also been some long-term data on Rock Lake, both in terms of number of piers as well as near shore fish communities. Some of this data indicates that as more structures have been added to the lake, the number of rare and intolerant near shore fish species have declined Notably, the black striped top minnow and the black nose shiner have not been documented in nearshore fish surveys on Rock Lake since 1974. These small fish are important canaries in the coal mine as they alert us that the lake habitat has been negatively impacted and those impacts can lead to other impairments to the lake. One of the last things you evaluate before moving on to the next parcel are the aquatic plants. You should look for emergent, floating, and submerged aquatic plants and record your data accordingly. This part of the survey is important. You could potentially find a unique or new species to your lake. If there is obvious aquatic plant removal in the parcel you are evaluating, make sure to check that box. Aquatic plant removal areas are generally demarcated by straight lines of cleared vegetation that are perpendicular to the shore and adjacent to plant beds. So let's try one last example. How many different types of aquatic plants do you see? So we have floating, emergent, and submerged. So we see all three. You can see what looks like water celery as the submerged plant and whitewater lily as the floating plant, and then what looks to be some kind of iris as the emergent. During the survey, the field crew takes photos of each individual parcel. The images should slightly overlap so you don't miss any part of your shoreline. It also makes the photos easier to identify when you're back in the office. You should make sure to check with your lake association or district before completing this survey. Seeing someone take a photo of your property can be disconcerting to some, and it's best to get the word out beforehand. The photo on the left shows the initial photo of this property during the 2016 Rock Lake survey. The photo on the right shows that same property with a rain garden installed. They also added a native plant shoreland garden. These practices were installed with the Healthy Lakes program cost sharing. Documenting the wood in the lake is done during a separate loop around the lake from the parcel loop. Natural wood is an important part of the lake ecosystem because it provides feeding, breeding, and nesting habitat for a variety of animals from small aquatic insects to turtles, fish, ducks, and songbirds. Fish sticks can also help prevent bank erosion, protecting lakeshore properties and your lake. There are a number of characteristics that are documented in the wood survey of the lake, including the branchiness of the wood. The data collected also documents whether the wood is touching shore or if a portion of the wood is above the water. The amount of wood that was documented in Rock Lake is considered low. The Rock Lake Improvement Association decided that they wanted to change that and use the data to move forward with fish sticks. Fish sticks is a practice that can be funded by the Healthy Lakes program in which upland trees are taken down and put in the water to create fish habitat. A few years ago, the Rock Lake Improvement Association installed bundles of trees at two locations on the lake. They are currently assessing whether additional fish sticks can be added to another area of the lake. The ideal sites for fish sticks have low ice and wave energy, such as protected bays, 
and shorelines leading to and from the bays. The time it takes to complete a shoreland and shallow survey will be determined based on how big your lake is. For example, as you can see, Green Lake took 75 hours with 23.6 miles of shoreline. For Lake Ripley, we were out on the actual water completing the parcel field work part of the survey for roughly 15 hours over two days. The wood loop took us about two and a half hours on a different day. The total cost of the Rock Lake Shoreland and Shallow Survey was about $12,500 and a portion was funded by the DNR. Um, the vast majority of the costs were for staff time to perform the survey, do data entry, data management, and writing a report. Uh, so Jefferson County donated much of their time, about $9,500 worth, and the DNR grant covered the remaining costs of $3,000. These surveys give us an incredible amount of data that can be used in so many different ways. Besides the data providing us with critical information, these surveys give the surveyor the opportunity to connect with lakeshore owners and detail the importance of a healthy shoreline. Educating homeowners is so important. Convincing just one person how important a healthy shoreline is can be considered a win, especially if they decide to install healthy lakes projects such as a native shoreland garden and rain garden. And with that, Leanna and I would be happy to answer any of your questions. Thanks so much for that presentation, Patricia and Leah. That was super interesting. Um, I have a question, if that's okay. <laughs> um, what if an individual wants to complete a survey um, but doesn't have the support or involvement of an association or like organization? Um, can they still do it? And if so, where can they send that data and will it get used? So uh, I'll, I'll start off. Uh, yeah, if somebody is interested, um, probably the actions I would tell them to take if they don't have a lake association is to contact their county land and water conservation department. Um, there may be somebody in that office who can do these surveys. There might not be. Um, so I would also tell them to contact their DNR lakes biologist, um, you know, there's different ones in different regions and they would know of other resources um, that can, can be used uh, to do these surveys. Um, in order to get a grant from the DNR, you have to be an approved uh, entity. So a lake association or a government, um, I'm looking at Leanna because she also is with the Lake District and so, She's staff with the Lake District and Lake Districts uh, might also be able to do these surveys. Yeah, nailed it on the head. <laughs> Can these surveys be done by beginners or do you need some kind of scientific background? Do you think it's pretty intuitive and you know easy to do? I would say that you would definitely need somebody with some kind of scientific background helping you to be able to properly find the, the erosion problems and things like that that we're looking for within this survey. But um, I think an unexperienced and an experienced person could go together and that way the unexperienced folk could lose or could gain some, some knowledge and then perhaps perform one of those later by themselves or with somebody else once they have the training and the experience, but you'll definitely want somebody experienced with you for the first time. Yeah, when I first started um, doing the Rock Lake survey, um, I had some of the people at the DNR who had put together the protocols come out with me um, because there, there is so much to cover and it could be a little overwhelming and you know, tr training your eye to figure out what the percent covers are and where the distance of 35 feet are. Um, 
it are really important to make sure you have down. Um, but once I got my legs <laughs> uh, for all the protocols, uh, I actually used a few different people who also had him done these surveys. Leanna was one of them. Um, and another uh, student from UW-Whitewater helped, uh, helped me. So definitely once you have somebody who knows what they're doing, you can easily train um, other people to help. Um, and really, you know, depending on the size of your lake, if you have a smaller lake, um, there it's not as big of a daunting task. Um, whereas the, you know, Rock Lake has lots of miles of shoreline. And so it was a really big job. Great, thanks. Um, we have a few from the audience. Uh, what other lakes in Jefferson County are going to be surveyed? So right now, uh, Rock Lake and Lake Ripley were the um, lakes that have had these um, surveys done on them. Uh, we haven't talked about um, how to move forward with other ones, uh, but I, I definitely am interested in doing that because I see uh, the huge value of having this information uh, so that it's great baseline data to understand what's going on on your lake um, and can be used in so many different ways as we uh, tried to cover um, not only educating citizens, um, but promoting uh, changes on properties uh, to try to increase uh, the health of our lakes into the future. Awesome, thank you. Um, how many passes do you make around the lake to get all the data? I guess it would depend on the size of the lake, but um, I guess to collect everything, how many passes? I can start this one. Um, well, you would do two loops. So the first loop would would include everything we mentioned about serving the parcel for the herbaceous and the percent cover and the erosion and the human structures on shore, human structures in littoral zone. So the first loop of the survey, you stop for about five to 10 minutes and you collect all of that data for each individual parcel. And the second loop is the loop that you go around and you collect all the data for your coarse woody habitat. So the, the fish sticks and the logs that are in the water. So technically you would only do two loops, but it takes so much time because you stop at each individual parcel and make sure that you're collecting all of the information, which does really take a long time, um, especially if folks have, you know, riprap or if they have a lot of things on shore or a lot of boats in the water, you have to make sure that you're being really diligent about collecting all of the information that you need. Another loop you can choose to do is uh, the photo loop um, and because it's just easier to have the boat drive and one person steering the boat and another person clicking photos as you go. And those photos I found really important once we were entering data because uh, you think you, you got captured everything. And then when you start putting the data in, you think, wait a minute, does that seem right? And then you can look at the photos. So I, I felt the photo loop uh, was a good uh, loop to do. And um, it's also helpful um, when we see some changes happening on the lake shore, we can go back and look at those photos to see what was there in the past. That actually leads great into the next question. Um, how many years back does your photo documentation go? So on Rock Lake, uh, we did the Shoreline and Shallows survey in 2015 and 2016. So those are our photos um, of the entire lake shore. Yeah, and for Lake Ripley, our first official survey was this year. So um, with the updated protocols, we took the pictures this year. So we have them for 2020. So last year, pardon me, 2020, and then we'll do it again in 2025. So ours just date back one year. Are you familiar with other lakes and associations that are participating in these surveys? Is it pretty well known through the state and there's a lot of people doing it? 
So that would be a really great question for Katie Hine uh, because she headed up uh, uh, doing, putting together the protocols that we used. Um, but I do know, um, you know, in our area, I know um, that, um, oh, I'm forgetting his name, Derek Cavanaugh uh, with uh, Green Lake County um, did a, some surveys in that county. Um, but yeah, I haven't kept up on what other counties have been doing. So I'm not, I can't answer that question, sorry. That's okay, that was simply out of my curiosity. Yeah. <laughs> what would you say for someone who's interested, like what is the first step um, to kind of get the ball rolling? Like, and, and are there people to help them um, come and do the surveys if they're not experienced? I know that might be hardened with everyone working and with COVID, but it, once it's available, would, would they be able to find someone to come and help them? Yeah, I guess, um, you know, again, uh, Katie Hine is a great resource um, to talk to um, and the uh, county land and water conservation departments and lake districts. Um, also, um, I know that there's probably some um, consulting firms that are doing this work as well. Um, so if, if you have an established lake association or district, um, then you know you can uh, help with the costs of that. Um, but I know that the um, those organ those uh, consulting firms can also help um, you uh, write grants to help fund it uh, with the DNR grant money. Um, so yeah, you know, really the, the costs are, the biggest costs are um, people time. Uh, so uh, I would say that, you know, if, if you can't do it yourself or get trained to do it yourself, um, then I would look at the DNR and uh, Lake Districts and counties and the consultants uh, to help you. Great, thanks. Um, do you see any problems with targeting specific properties with erosion problems? So yeah, I mean, um, getting practices implemented on the land all has to do with public participation and willingness to do that. So uh, certainly uh, I know on Rock Lake, the Rock Lake Improvement Association has been an invaluable partner because they do so many things to educate the citizens around the lake um, in order to again and again, give them the information about what a healthy lake shore is. Um, they've done a lot of workshops. Um, they've done direct mailings to uh, really uh, encourage people to take advantage of the Healthy Lakes program um, practices and the money that can be available to help implement those things. Um, so really, it, I, I think it's great um, to have partnerships uh, with the lake organizations um, because they, they help do the work. Um, on Rock Lake, we also... Um, have somebody who's on the board of the Rock Lake Improvement Association that uh, some of the pictures were of her property where she installed a, a shoreline garden and as well as a rain garden. And she also has been invaluable uh, to, to be a resource for other lakeshore property owners because she'll, she can invite people over to her property uh, to show them what she did and what success um, she's had um, with, with increasing native plants and on her property. Yeah, same with Lake Ripley. We do a lot of similar stuff. Um, we have a native plant sale every year that we encourage people to participate in. We do cost share agreements with the Healthy Lakes grant. Um, we have a Ripples newsletter that we send out to remind people that they want to protect their lake. And so that means they should be protecting their shoreline. We actually took a book out of, or a page out of Patricia's book in the Rock Lake Improvement Association where we would love to um, start a workshop where we take 
folks who are interested in planting some native plants to another home that has a beautiful uh, shoreline planting or, or buffer to show them, you know, what their home could look like and what their yard could look like with native plants. So um, it can be difficult, but just education and, and, you know, finding that connection that you have with people um, that that's always helpful. Have you seen positive improvements since you've collected this data? Like, is it progressing and in, in the utilization of the data, like how you were hoping? And do you think it will continue on both lakes? I know Lee's years was a very short, short time span, but still. Yeah, mine I don't, I'm not able to really compare yet, but ask me in 2025. <laughs> <laughs> And for Rock Lake, we're hopefully gonna um, redo the survey uh, this year. Um, and uh, certainly there have been changes uh, on the shoreline of Rock Lake. Um, I will say, unfortunately, this last year, we have seen, especially on one side of the lake, a lot of um, negative actions taken. Um, I think people are having more time and, and because of being home from COVID, um, working from home, that people have been just doing a lot of projects. And unfortunately, there's been a number of violations that have happened where people are cutting things down without the proper permits or proper plans. So that's been really disconcerting for us. But at the same time, um, we have been getting more and more interest in uh, property owners doing these practices. Um, and also, you know, again, in partnership with the Rock Lake Improvement Association, I feel that more people are um, getting the message uh, that native plants are really important to the shoreland area and reducing impervious surfaces is important um, and reducing, um, what your impacts are in the water um, for putting in structures also. So I'm hopeful that in the future, uh, we'll be able to make a lot more progress and get more practices on the land that are just gonna protect the lake. Awesome, uh, I might've missed this, but I'm not sure. Was there like a single event that kind of um, started this this process and the restoration, like a concerning event, like an algal bloom or something, or was it just kind of something that you saw a need or the board saw a need and kind of took the initiative? So uh, I started doing the Shoreland and Shallows survey on Rock Lake or saw the need for it because um, I had seen other, other surveys being done um, throughout the state. And at that point, there wasn't really protocols in, that were being used, but different people were putting forward different um, ways to do these shoreline and shallow surveys. Um, so I, I saw the need for it and applied for a DNR grant. And at the same time, the DNR started um, to see that there was a need to have uh, specific protocols and so um, my project was actually put on hold for a while because I wanted to make sure that I used the DNR protocols. And so um, I waited and also participated in some of their meetings on developing the protocols. Um, again, I, I just felt like there's so much valuable information that you gain uh, from doing these surveys, um, you know, not just to help um, people uh, do shoreline restorations, um, but also to get the data that is showing that we're getting more development on the water and on the lake and that has negative impacts to the lake sometimes. So um, I think it's important to get that data so that we can continue to educate the property owners um, who love that lake so much and all you know property owners love their lakes and so you know once you have the data you can start showing 
some of these linkages uh, that are happening with increased development and some of the research that's been happening so that, you know, as we continue down the road that more and more people will understand uh, what they do on their property, either negatively or positively impacts the lake. And so I, that's why I um, started the project and, and think that they're really valuable surveys. Yeah, similarly over here as well. Uh, my predecessor had seen the need for it and had seen Patricia doing them um, and collaborated and, and thought, okay, Lake Ripley should should also start doing these and make sure that we have this data. So same for us. Awesome. Thank you so much again to both of you and everyone that, that tuned in. Um, if you guys have other questions for the speakers and stuff, you can feel free to reach out and ask them directly. Um, have a great rest of the day, everybody. Thanks. Thanks, you guys. Thank you.